many thanks uh, for taking the time out to uh, come and hear Professor Jeffrey Alexander tonight. Uh, I know, especially in light of the inclement weather we've been experiencing today, I wasn't sure if people would be able to make their way up. Um, so it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, uh, now, before we begin uh, with the lecture proper, uh, I wanted to give you a brief outline on uh, how the talk will proceed tonight. Um, following a very brief introduction by myself, uh, Professor Jeffrey Alexander will then speak for approximately 50 minutes. Um, and this will be followed by a short question and answer session. Uh, our aim is to finish the event uh, by about 10 minutes to 8 at the very latest. Um, uh, and also, I, I would like to mention that uh, several of Professor Alexander's most recent books, uh, including the hot off the press book entitled The Dark Side of Modernity, will be available for purchase at a special reduced rate following this event. Uh, they'll be available for purchase for £10. And in fact, that's the reason for us finishing a little bit early, uh, because Professor Alexander is uh, willing to sign a few copies, uh, and they'll be for sale in the, hall, in the corridor uh, at the entrance to the um, lecture hall. Now, if you don't mind, before passing uh, the floor over to Professor Alexander, I would like to say a few words about the Paris Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. Uh, which is co-hosting this event uh, alongside the Department of Politics at Birkbeck. Uh, unfortunately, Professor David Feldman, the Institute's director, is unable to be here tonight. Uh, so on his behalf, I will just say a few words about the Institute and how its work relates to the broad subject of multiculturalism, which is the subject, as you can see, of tonight's talk. Uh, the Department of Politics at Birkbeck is delighted to be hosting this public lecture with the Paris Institute. The Paris Institute was established at Birkbeck just two years ago, and in that time it has quickly gained an international reputation for its approach to the study of antisemitism, based on its founding principle that the study of antisemitism is vital to understanding all forms of racism and religious prejudice. It is the exploration of these linkages that makes the Paris Institute different from many other centers for the study of antisemitism around the world. Its interest lies in connecting issues around anti-Semitism and the integration of the Jewish minority within state, society, and culture to issues around racism and the politics of diversity more generally. In this respect, the topic of Professor Alexander's talk tonight is particularly pertinent. The Institute is co-founder of an international research project exploring Muslims and Jews, Citizenship, Identity, and Prejudice in Europe, the U.S. and Israel. Through a series of workshops in five countries, the project seeks to explore the ways Muslims and Jews experience and respond to multiculturalism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia today. The Paris Institute hosted the first workshop in London last February, and this April sees the third, which will be held in Paris. Now, uh, if you bear with me, I would like to say a few words about Professor Alexander. Professor Jeffrey C. Alexander is the Lillian Shavitson Saden Professor of Sociology at Yale University and founder and co-director of the Center for Cultural Sociology, also based at Yale University. In my view, it is difficult to overstate Professor Alexander's contributions to social theory and the social sciences. Over the past few years, Alexander has been the key figure in the development of a cultural approach to social research uh, referred to as the Strong Program. In the words of one noted social theorist, the aim of the Strong Program is nothing less than an ambitious attempt to refound the social sciences so that culture is acknowledged as a relatively independent social force and treated as a central explanatory element in the social researcher's toolkit. Now, probably due to his elegant writing style, which enables him to communicate complicated ideas in an accessible way, and what seems to be an unbounded energy, Professor Alexander has already gone some distance towards achieving his aims, as demonstrated by a growing number of research centers at leading universities across the globe that now engage with his approach. Indeed, Alexander can be said to be at the center of what might be properly called a new intellectual movement. 
In addition to Professor Alexander's remarkable academic achievements, I can also attest to his great kindness and generosity, having had the opportunity to get to know Professor Alexander personally over the past couple of years. Despite his incredible work ethic, Professor Alexander always somehow finds time for discussion and sage advice, especially in relation to younger scholars. In my opinion, he's an ideal mentor and indeed an inspiration. Indeed, I find him to be an exemplary example of the continued value of mentoring from one generation to another. It is therefore an honor and great pleasure to present to you today Professor Jeffrey Alexander, who will speak to you today on the topic of the ongoing backlash against multiculturalism in Europe. Now, I can't live up to that introduction, but I want to say that I'm very pleased uh, to be um, talking to you about this topic in connection with uh, this Institute for Anti-Semitism because I've um, written a lot about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust in relationship to the theoretical issues that I'll be talking about tonight. And uh, I think they are very, very parallel and mutually enlightening, these the problems with Muslims and problems with Jews. A civil sphere that promises every person legal, political, and cultural standing is a new social invention in the history of humankind. Aristocracies treated lower orders as practical necessities. Patrimonial empires tolerated outsiders if they paid their taxes as guests. In neither social system could groups from the periphery enter into the center. Deference and sometimes even reciprocity were possible. Genuine inclusion was not. Since this novel social form has become available, However, the actual incorporation of outgroups has been anything but guaranteed. Inclusion is contingent. It can be blocked and reversed. Classes, religions, ethnicities, races, genders, regions, and sexualities are compelled to engage in extraordinarily difficult political and cultural struggle. They have often been defeated and sometimes even destroyed. Until recently, moreover, social uh, core groups have been willing to entertain the idea of incorporation only in an asymmetrical manner. Outgroups would be allowed to enter liberal societies if they took on the manners and morals of core groups, agreeing to make their own ethno culture invisible, practicing it in private but not public life. The problem with such an assimilative mode of incorporation is that it leaves the polluted qualities of outsiders pretty much in place. In a sense, persons can be incorporated, but not their qualities. This is not only hypocritical in a moral sense, but as the history of modernity has amply demonstrated, it can be empirically explosive. The cataclysmic wars and massive repressions of the 20th century were fueled in some significant part by the violent stigmas that festered and often intensified just beneath the surface of ostensibly inclusive contemporary societies. As the social costs and moral lessons of these disasters sank in, the possibility of a new, more responsive, multicultural mode of incorporation gradually but ineluctably entered into the collective consciousness of modern societies. Perhaps not only people, but their distinctive qualities could be accepted. If outgroups committed themselves to the moral discourse and legal ground rules of the civil sphere, might they be allowed to retain some of the distinctive cultural beliefs and practices foreign to the traditions of core groups. This idea of a more symmetrical bargain implies a mutual learning process. It is not only the incoming group that changes, but the morals and manners of core groups. Rather than repugnance, they learn to respect certain outgroup qualities. 
Sometimes such, such, such demonstrations of respect are merely performances of positivity in response to politically correct forms of social constraint. Often, however, they are actually genuine. Enlarging their cultural horizons, some core group members do experience genuine appreciation. Some even come to revere differences displayed by the once excluded, now more fully incorporated groups from the outside. Multiculturalism wears different faces. It may be stigmatized gender and sexual qualities that challenge the traditional cultural performances of core groups. It may be qualities of region, ethnicity, and race. Struggles for multicultural incorporation also proceed along different paths. In Canada, once conquered Aborigines and Quebecois forcefully demanded an alternative to assimilation. In the US, black Americans, first enslaved and then subject to brutal racial domination, struggled not only for equality, but for the legitimacy of what came to be called African American culture, which while informing Americanism, was also eventually seen as distinctive and to many laudable in its own right. In contemporary Europe, where internal colonialism and racial enslavement have largely been absent, struggles over multicultural incorporation have centered recently on immigration, largely of the Islamic kind. Historically, immigrant qualities have also, of course, been a major flashpoint in America, and some of them remain hugely controversial today. On its better days, the U.S. has opened its doors, imagining itself a land of immigrants. On worse days, core groups have defined America much more narrowly and locked the gates. In recent decades, anti-immigration feelings, however, have been relatively subdued. It's continuing racism against African Americans that constitutes a central stumbling block for the success of America's multicultural play. In Europe, the situation is quite the reverse. Not so much the racial, but the ethnic and religious qualities of the new wave of immigrant outsiders has challenged the collective identities of Europe's core groups in increasingly troubling ways. It is with the European struggle over how to incorporate these new immigrant groups and sometimes over whether to incorporate them that my talk today is concerned. Inside history's most radical experiment in supranational and anti-ethnic democracy, the European Union, there has emerged a molting fear that particularly vis-a-vis -vis Muslim immigration, the independent status of the European civil sphere has become vulnerable. From this sense of endangerment has followed newly restrictive legal, administrative, and political measures, the rise to popularity of extremist political parties, and episodes not merely of random violence against Muslims, but organized murderous attacks against outspoken supporters of the multicultural expansion of European civil societies. Certainly, immigration has triggered a wide range of responses within each European nation and substantially different reactions among them. And that has been studied, uh, that has been generally the focus of, of study inside of Europe. Increasingly, however, antagonism to the seemingly anti-civil qualities of recent arrivals has sparked a backlash against immigration that is Europe-wide. Europe's new super, super diversity is experienced as casting a threatening shadow over its future. This sense of imminent danger already has triggered a good deal of empirical and policy-oriented research. For example, a widely noticed report in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society argues that in Britain, the contemporary clustering of immigrants is not anomalous in demographic terms. 
Historically, immigration waves have always created patterns of ethnic separation for reasons both of protective solidarity and economic advantage. The isolation of contemporary Islamic immigrants, it continues, or other studies have showed, has never exceeded a 30% concentration, and it's gradually diminishing. Another study surveys the immigrant second generation in eight European countries and discovers there is increasing incorporation in terms of some objective indices. For example, immigrant children develop significantly more ties with core group members than their parents possessed. And in fact, these mixed ties far exceed those sustained by native Europeans. Educational attainment has also markedly increased, with high percentages of the second generation finishing secondary schools, moving into higher education. According to another Dutch study, fully 40% of second generation children currently in school are enrolled in colleges or universities. And among the second generation, positive feelings to their host nation have significantly increased. Social scientists have also observed that despite the continent-wide backlash against multiculturalism, which I'm going to talk about, localities have continued to sustain policies that adapt their institutions to immigrant difference. In the UK, ethnic and racial minorities are still frequent recipients of financial support and differential treatment from city governments. In France, the Grands Ecoles have instituted, quote, special administration, administrative procedures to increase the numbers of disadvantaged students. There's a diversity buzz in France among large companies and, quote, and what they call framework agreements to increase minority hiring have been signed in France by the big unions, big companies, and entire branches of the national bureaucracy. In such major European cities as Copenhagen, Stuttgart, Vienna, Zurich, and Dublin, diversity practices have been built into a whole range of institutional policies. These factual reports, however, say next to nothing about how these shifting structural realities of immigration are being subjectively understood by Europe's core groups or whether indeed these structural improvements have been registered at all. A report to the Dutch Parliamentary Committee of Inquiry in 2004 concluded, quote, the facts do not corroborate the popular belief that socioeconomic integration has failed. But it made no effort to measure or explain why there was such an erroneous popular belief. In its upbeat 2008 report on EU equality and diversity policies, the Council of Europe carefully circumscribed its mandate to creating, quote, conditions conducive to the peaceful coexistence between migrants and other residents. Peaceful coexistence is a term that applies to a truce between enemies. It is hardly a description of the relations one envisions within a democratic and inclusive social order. That's how low the bar is set in terms of EU policy making. Conceiving immigration primarily in economic, demographic, and narrowly political terms, empirical researchers have largely missed the meanings of immigration and the emotions such meanings create. Immigration isn't simply a behavioral fact, it's also a symbol, and symbols are constructed out of difference. Immigrants are imagined as much as they are described. Such collective imaginings are a matter for cultural sociology, not demography. Social responses to Immigration may tell us relatively little about the objective situation, but they reveal a great deal about the conditions 
of social solidarity. Solidarity is about the sense of connection, a matter of feeling and meaning. How a community responds to immigration is a matter of collective identity. Who are we and who aren't we? Who are they and who aren't they? Even in modern technological societies, solidarity remains a major focus of feeling, meaning, reward, and sanction. It's as robust as any economic or political institution. It's as meaningful as religion, as emotionally affecting as family. The affective and moral meaning of us, what might, what might be called weeness, is a fundamental structuring social force. The other side of weeness, equally potent, is difference. Who are they and why are they here? The experience of modernity has made it painfully clear that solidarity can be structured in strikingly different ways. Primordial solidarities tie loyalty to particular places, groups, and beliefs. Such bonds, of course, have been central to human society from time immemorial. But processes like cultural abstraction institutional differentiation and territorial expansion create a possibility for a different kind of solidarity that is more civil and less primordial. As compared with primordial connections, civil solidarity creates more universal ties, relations that only seem as if they are more imagined than concrete. In the name of ethical rather than ethnic concerns, civil solidarity allows separation from and criticism of what have seemed earlier to be immutably binding primordial and restrictive bonds. Variation in the forms of solidarity is closely linked to how difference is constructed. The more civil the solidarity the more likely feelings of connection can be extended to include apparently different others. The more one's own solidary ties are experienced as primordial, the less likely is one to make positive connections with strangers. Every modern democratic society, and even decidedly less than democratic modern societies, possesses some version of a civil sphere. A civil sphere being a sphere that has at its core these non-primordial ties. The discourse, the institutions, and the face-to-face -face relations of a civil sphere can be considered as analytically separated and as to some degree empirically distinct from those that mark non-civil spheres like markets, states, churches, schools, families. And it can also be, the civil sphere can also be considered as very separated or variably separated from gemeinschaftlich solidarities that are primordial, that define ethnicity, gender, sexuality, race, religion. The civil sphere is aspirational. One might conceive a civil world as situated among non-civil institutions and solidarities, promoting a very idealized discourse according to which justice and the symbolic and material distributions which follow from justice is calibrated simply on the basis of being fellow member of the human race. Civil solidarity sacralizes individual autonomy, yet simultaneously imposes moral responsibilities to others. Membership inside the civil sphere means that regardless of one's status in other spheres, in family or religion, ethnicity, race, or the market, one deserves to be treated with respect and recognized as having basic human rights. 
But what if one has not yet arrived at the doorstep of the civil sphere, but is simply on the way? Or what if one is only approaching the doorway of the civil sphere? How does the civil sphere deal not with the internal boundaries vis-a-vis -vis non civil spheres, but with its external boundaries vis-a-vis -vis potential members from other national collectivities, other regions, other civilizations? In terms of its idealizing principles, the civil sphere requires that those who are here as citizens should be treated as full members, whether or not they have recently arrived. Those who have, invite, who have been invited here to meet economic or political exigencies or for the moral reason of asylum should be treated as honored guests, even if they are not yet citizens. Granted civil, if not political rights, such guests should be extended cultural recognition and social support commensurate with their status as fellow human beings. Depending on their length of residence, they should be offered a clear pathway to citizenship. As for those who have come here illegally, without being invited, they should be treated fairly, without a commitment to legal corporate incorporation. If they create economic profits and political legitimacy for core groups, raise families, participate directly and indirectly in the cultural and educational patrimony of a nation, their status should be allowed to change. They and their children should be allowed to naturalize with eventual citizenship, the expected result. These are the shoulds and the oughts that define civil sphere obligations in moral or normative terms. If the discourse and institutions of civil society were ideal, if the institutions were really independent, social action vis-a-vis -vis immigrants and sojourners would follow from these do's and don'ts, but it doesn't. Real civil spheres, well, rather than free-floating, civil spheres are instantiated in actually existing social relations. You may remember the term actually existing socialism. Well, there's actually existing civil society. Real civil spheres are brought to life inside narrowly delimited national and regional collectivities. They are directed and sustained by core groups, by social actors of particular religious, racial, and linguistic stripes who have occupied the territory of civil society for a long time. Even in the most democratic societies, one is not only defined as a member of the civil community, but as a member of a tribe. It is not that these more particular non-civil qualities replace the idealistic discourse of civil bonds. What they do, rather, is they bend these ideals toward their own purposes. Here is the pride and prejudice that limit civil aspirations in even the most democratic nation states. In real civil societies, there is a hierarchy of qualities arranged according to which are deemed most and least capable of promoting civil participation. Those that mo most often get the green light just happen to be the particular qualities of the core group. The folks who arrived early, whose ancestors were connected with the sacred ground, or who have some close connection with those who were. This uneven distribution of putatively civil charisma helps justify exclusion and domination, especially when it's combined with hi hierarchies that emanate from the non-civil spheres, such as economic and political failure. Insofar as immigrants do not possess core charisma, sojourners are stigmatized regardless of their citizenship status. In fact, many immigrants, as we all know, are so polluted, they will never be allowed to become citizens, and, there will, and no pathway for naturalization will ever be laid out. The conflict between primordial 
primordially pure, quote-unquote, qualities, which seem naturally to warrant civil incorporation, and polluted qualities which seem to justify exclusion and repression mark the bloody first half of Europe's 20th century. The principal antagonisms of the First World War were motivated by primordial nationalities. In the Second World War, otherness was key more to racial and religious categories. Such hatreds fueled not only external, international military campaigns against liberals, communists, and Nazis, but internal, international, genocidal campaigns against entire categories of people, Jews, Slavs, Romani, homosexuals, disabled. The European community and later its union emerged from the burning embers of these struggles. It aimed to extend the broad tent of the civil sphere across the continent, subordinating national, ethnic, religious, and regional ties to a more universalistic European solidarity constructed from the trauma of Europe's internecine past. The effort to create such a European civil sphere fueled and was fueled by the emergence of nationally democratic regimes across at least Western Europe. The post-war European project was put into place by a cosmopolitan carrier group its rules administered by a centralized bureaucracy without the full panoply of supporting civil institutions. There were, for example, scarcely any effectively Europe-wide media of mass communication. The reach of EU law was gradual and halting. The power of European voting and political organization was minimal. Yet despite these limitations, the European superstate succeeded in significantly reducing ethnic, racial, and religious othering inside the continent and eliminated the possibility that such sentiments, when they did circulate, would trigger genocide or war. Pacifying Europe's internal relations, however, has not necessarily helped to civilize Europe's relations with others want to come into it from the outside. In fact, the new idea of a unified and pacified Europe may have made it even more difficult, creating collective amnesia about the history of Europe's own fractious prejudices and its history and the history of its own construction from earlier waves of immigration. Certainly the post-war settlement in Europe is unprecedented and world historical. It's a fantastic accomplishment. Democratic inclusion and welfare states at the, at the national level, a supranational, relatively cosmopolitan European civil sphere on top. The danger, however, is that this settlement has also generated an equal and opposite reaction, creating a fortress Europe vis-a-vis -vis the world outside. As this fortress has confronted the tsunami of globalization, a great shaking has been the result. During the centuries of Europe's colonial expansion, non-Western others, at least those who were not enslaved, were compelled to remain in their peripheral place. They were not allowed to move into the metropole of the colonizer. The post-colonial world that emerged after World War II <coughs> undercut the territorial rootedness of these non-Western subjects. This shift was facilitated by dramatically increased global opportunities for movement and communication and intensified by the demographic shrinking of Europe's working populations. So significant numbers of non-European others began arriving in Western Europe. They were invited for political and economic reasons not, at first at least, because national groups actually wished to expand their putatively homogeneous cores. In 1960, as post-war economic recovery took hold, non-Western others were imported as unskilled manual labor. 
large-scale gas turbine programs emerged in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, and soon after, if less conspicuously, in other European nations. For other European states, opening up to non-Western immigration was a matter of imperial failure, triggering a new post-colonial strategy. Responding to their loss of colonies with a mixture of prurience and dignity, Britain and France opened up their national civil spheres to former colonials. The Netherlands did the same, guaranteeing full civil rights for immigrants from Suriname and Antilles. Eventually, millions of former colonials migrated to the metropoles with immediate or eventual citizenship guaranteed. The number of non-Western immigrants was also swelled, particularly in Scandinavia, by new policies offering generous asylum to non-Western victims of political, ethnic, and religious persecution. By the early 1970s, the initial conditions triggering expansive immigration had either abated or changed. Post-war economies leveled off, guest worker programs ended, the open door to former colonials was closed. While most guest workers from within Europe returned to their home countries, most from outside Europe stayed. Constitutional procedures prevented them from being forcibly repatriated. Family transfer policies allowed them to be joined by their families, and their birth rates far exceeded the fertility of native groups. By the 1980s, immigrants from outside Europe had become a significant presence inside Europe. Today, upwards of 32.5 million residents <clears throat> are non-nationals, people who are not citizens of their country of residence. That's about 6.5% of the entire European population, and it's much higher in the western part of Europe. In Germany, the figure is 9%, and in many, in many large cities, it's much higher, anywhere from 15 to 40%. Inside urban areas, immigrant residents in economically disadvantaged areas, of course, is much higher still. And that only refers to non-citizens in residence, not to, for, to later generations who are still part of an immigrant group in terms of how they're treated. Having been brought inside European territory by reason of economy and state, immigrant outsiders now faced the question of whether they would be allowed to become members of the civil sphere. This pregnant question is proven to be wrenchingly difficult to answer. In 1969, an influential report for the French Economic and Social Council referring to the new influx of non-European origin and principally the fall from the Maghreb asserted as a self-evident fact that such immigrants constituted, quote, an unassimilable island. The primordial qualities of these sojourners were not just different from this or that national core group, but markedly distinct from those that had historically defined Europe itself. The immigrants were not Western. They were not Christian. They were not white. They did not come from societies thought to be modern, but from so-called Oriental societies, from Africa, Turkey, Arabia, and South Asia, all lands that had once been conquered by the West. If there was one quality uniting these ethnically and racially disparate immigrants, moreover, it was the most historically stigmatized trait of all, their Muslim religion. The battle between Christian Europe and Islam had stretched over six centuries, from the First Crusade in 1099 to the Ottoman sieges of Vienna, with the long occupation of the Iberian Peninsula in between. For centuries, the West had been able to claim victory in this millennial confrontation. But with the end of colonialism, the battle had been fiercely rejoined. In the transition from Nasser's pan-Arabism to the rise of OPEC, the PLO, the Iranian Revolution, the Gulf and Iraq Wars, and Al-Qaeda terrorism, the image of Arab 
Arabic Islam was configured in seemingly ever more aggressive and anti-civil ways. For increasing members of the European civil sphere, ancient enemies outside were becoming new immigrants within. Now, one response to Europe's new demographic superdiversity was to undertake the arduous task of making the European civil sphere more free-floating, to separate it further from traditional core group qualities, and to begin positively evaluating, instead of denigrating, non-Western origins, custom, skin color, and religion. At least until the early 1990s, there were signs that European masses and elites were indeed moving in this direction. India, Indian, Pakistani, Maghrebi, Middle Eastern ethnicities certainly altered the physiognomy of Europe. Economically productive ethnic enclaves emerged. In Britain and Netherlands, curries and rice salads challenged sausage and sauerkraut, bangers and mash. As I mentioned earlier, immigrant access to education was streamlined. Urban accommodations to religious and cultural differences were made. And a handful of non-Western figures entered into Europe's cultural and political elites. In France, Britain, the Netherlands, Scandinavia, sometimes even in Germany, liberal and socialist political figures and social scientists alike proclaimed that the historical opportunity for creating a post-national, newly multicultural Europe was at hand. You can see tons of writing to that effect in the 90s. So did many public intellectuals. Stuart Hall famously spoke about the, quote, rebranding Britain and a new sense of, quote, plural blackness. Even during these early decades, however, the new non-Western immigration was also engendering decidedly less accommodative reactions. For many Europeans, it was like waking up after an evening of post-war indulgence without a morning after pill. The Tory MP Enoch Powell gave his incendiary Rivers of Blood speech in 1968. By the late, later 1990s, such spasms of antagonism were congealing into a backlash against disengaging, against disengaging the European civil sphere from its primordial foundations. By the 2000s, multiculturalism was being renounced by intellectuals and political leaders on both left and right. Certainly, the events of September 11th, 2001, gave sharp impulse to this developing reaction and expressions of revulsion and hostility spread widely, if unevenly, inside the mass culture of Europe. This risable cultural turn polluted the public practices and places of Islam, translating them into the negative categories of anti-civil discourse. Protesters placed pig heads in front of mosques, splashed pig urine in blood in doorways, and defaced walls of Muslim worship with graffiti. In 2009, the Swiss passed a national referendum outlawing minarets, and the extremist Dutch political leader Geert Wilders began pronouncing upon mosques as places of hatred. He's also a mainstream politician, of course. A group of leading Dutch cartoonists attacked the prophet Allah, depicting him as a narrow-minded tyrant, buffoon, and a malicious prig. In 2011, the French Republic made it illegal for girls in state schools to wear the traditional headscarf. Over the course of two decades of vitriolic public debate, the veil had been constructed in France as a sign of submission to patriarchal authority and religious dogma, despite contrary evidence from social scientists, and often from the girls themselves. In one widely publicized incident, um, a French cabinet minister from the Conservative Party denied citizenship to a fully veiled Moroccan woman in 2008. He, I mean, when a judge denied citizenship because uh, she was wearing a full, full covering, 
The French cabinet minister called the niqab a prison and a straitjacket, insisting, quote, it is not a religious insignia, but the sign of a totalitarian political program that promotes inequality between sexes and is totally lacking in democracy. In other words, um, Muslim observance is a danger to the civil sphere. That's what I mean by primordial qualities being converted into anti-civil ones. The woman replied, they say I am under my husband's command, but I want to tell them it's my choice. Writing in the leftist Guardian newspaper, British Foreign Minister Jack Straw, whom the Times of London and once described as the one decent man in British politics, sharply polluted Islamic female clothing as well, stressing the binary between civil, sacred, and anti-civil profane. Straw denounced the, quote, incongruity between, quote, the fact of the veil and the signals which indicate common bonds. Straw suggested that such covering made honest face-to-face relations impossible. Quote, I feel uncomfortable about talking to someone face-to-face who I could not see because I could not see what the other person means and not just hear what they say. He concludes, quote, such a visible statement of separation and difference as wearing the full veil is bound to make better positive relations between the two communities impossible. So you can see the the customs and habits of Islamic religion directly converted into anti-democratic practices in the minds even of progressive uh, people in Europe. Insofar as Muslim practices and places are constructed as dangerously anti-civil, and we, in this audience, we, we, the, we should understand that's what happened to Jews, of course, for most of their existence. The categories that Jews were identified as secretive, conspiratorial, greedy, selfish, aggressive, murderous. These are all anti-civil qualities, which meant they could not be incorporated. It would be dangerous. You don't incorporate people like that. So insofar as Muslim practices were constructed as dangerously anti-civil, the presence of Muslims is viewed as threatening European democracy. By the middle of the last decade, European-wide polls were reporting Quote, a vast majority feels that their country has reached the limits of cultural or ethnic diversity. Four of ten respondents opposed granting civil rights even to legal immigrants, and fully one-third supported repatriation. According to this backlash group, it was multicultural policies that created the segregation of European societies. The problem was too much respect for Islamic difference, not anti-Muslim discrimination and social disadvantage. In 2005, a Mora poll commissioned by the BBC reported that one-third of the nation's citizens believed multiculturalism threatens the British way of life, viewing it as, quote, incompatible with the values of British democracy. And slightly more than half agreed, quote, parts of our country don't feel like Britain anymore because of immigrants. In 2007, the conservative leader David Cameron equated multiculturalism with, quote, cultural separatism, denounced it as, quote, a deliberate weakening of our collective identity. That same year, The Economist reported, quote, a new obscenity has entered the lexicon alongside the anatomical and the blasphemous multiculturalism. In 2008, Labor Minister Hazel Blairs Blairs, declared that Britain should not, quote, risk using public money on projects that might unnecessarily keep people apart. And David Cameron called multiculturalism a disastrous and wrong-handed doctrine that instituted, quote, quite literally, a legal apartheid. What the speechwriter for Labor's Home Secretary David Blunkett called the new M word 
denoted nothing less, according to a widely read British columnist, than a policy of, quote, state coercion that stifles debates and is ruthlessly placed by armies of bureaucrats. For their parts, the French spoke of balkanization and communitarianism, and the Germans of parallel societies. Wilfred Schobel, Germany's powerful Christian democratic interior minister, explained, quote, if we want to feel part of a collectivity, then there must be something that connects us at a deeper human level, at the level of religion and culture, values and identity. One might expect this of conservatives, but what's striking is that liberals and socialist intellectuals um, protested Islamic immigration in the same way. <laughs> There's many examples of this. One of the most significant was in 2000 when the Dutch sociologist and social democrat Paul Schaefer published a lengthy critical essay in a prominent evening newspaper, the NRC Handelsblatt, called The Multicultural Drama. The article became one of the most influential intellectual political polemics of this emerging backlash movement. Looking back fondly to the day when, quote, the political elite used to possess a clear civilizing mission, Schaefer declared that integration while maintaining identity is a pious lie denounced, quote, the house of cards that is the multicultural society and called for restoring the, quote, even-handedness and, quote, brutal bargain of assimilation. If multiculturalism is, dis is sharply discredited, yet Islamic immigrants are in Europe to stay, the only solution is to purify their polluted qualities. Whether governed from the left or right, one European nation after another has shifted, sometimes subtly, but more often with increasing outspokenness and clarity, from entertaining a more multicultural to demanding a more assimilative mode of incorporation. Rather than speaking explicitly about homogeneity and assimilation, this new stance is widely described as civic integration. In 2004, David Goodert, the head of Britain's Equal Opportunities Commission, declared that because, quote, most of us prefer to be with our own kind, end quote, nations have a right to make, quote, shared histories and similar values, end quote, a prerequisite for social incorporation. In 2006, Oxford Analytica represented this new policy as moving from the recognition of difference to an emphasis on, quote, loyalty, integration, and European values. Such shifting cultural construction has had increasing material effect. Much tougher immigration and naturalization policies have been one immediate result. During the course of the last decade, so-called citizenship tests have been erected as bulky barriers to immigrant incorporation. Rather than concentrating on impersonal and universalistic facts concerning length of residence, employment record, and legal status, the new criteria of these citizenship tests demand would-be citizens demonstrate familiarity with particularistic national traditions The earlier British example of this tested how one should react in a pub when one's neighbor spills beer on one's lap. That was, to know how to respond was, was considered a prerequisite for citizenship. The newest British test, which takes effect next month, requires knowledge of a 180-page home office document, textbook, really. And here I, I want to read briefly from a Guardian report about this 180-page text on January 28th, which was the day before the new textbook went on sale. Just read a 
couple of things. It starts off, from highly trained heart surgeons to hardworking vegetable pickers, immigrants will be told today that they will only be considered for UK citizenship if they can correctly answer Britishness questions on a range of topics, from the principles of medieval land ownership to the invention of the hovercraft. The achievements of Monty Python, Woodyard Kipling, Andrew Lloyd Webber are all included in a new 180-page home office syllabus which asks potential citizens to learn about Britain's history, culture, and values from the Stone Age to the 2010 general election before they take a new and more tough life in the UK test as part of the government's intention to dramatically reduce net migration. In what critics dismissed as the equivalent of an outdated public school entrance exam, a textbook written by home office officials goes on sale today with sections on the engineering achievements of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, Churchill's great speeches, Margaret Thatcher, and the writer Robert Burns. That's what you call particularism as compared to civil qualities. You need to be British before you can become British. And I don't think that most people in England today could pass that test. It requires 75%. Aside from the particularistic new texts or tests, the legal rules for granting citizenship have toughened remarkably. The French rewrote their civil code from bestowing citizenship on immigrant children at birth to waiting until they attained their majority at the age of 18. An incredible change. Even then, would-be citizens must show themselves to be, quote, well assimilated to customs and manners, a la Francais. Under a new rubric called Earned Citizenship, the British now demand a three-year probation period along with signs that, quote, active citizenship is, quote, benefiting local communities. In Germany, would-be citizens must spend 600 hours in German language instruction. Sheer torture. <laughs> in Denmark, they are required to attend civil, civic classes at their own expense, and family members of naturalized Dutch immigrants must wait three years to join them, needing also to pass an attachment test. There's more to the European backlash against multiculturalism than polluting sentiments, discriminatory actions, and even newly restrictive laws and policies. Under the guise of demanding assimilation to common democratic values, Extremist political parties have moved aggressively onto the European stage. Hate spewing populist demagogues have gained not only public podiums, but parliamentary power. In Sweden, Finland, Denmark, France, Italy, Switzerland, and the Netherlands, there has also been an incendiary rise of extra political militia that moved past rhetoric to violence outright. In Germany, the Office for the Protection of the Constitution recently reported 25,000 Germans active in such far-right militia. In Norway, on June 22, 2011, Anders Breivik massacred 77 persons in Oslo and Utøya, most of them children and youth. Styling himself a crusading Knight Templar, Breivik's chilling manifesto echoed the anti-civil logic of the polluting European backlash. Quote, all over Europe, multicultural elites are waging war against their own populations. Their goal is to continue the strategy of mass migration, which will result in Islamic Europe, a Europe without freedom, Eurabia. For a while during the last decades of the 20th century, it looked as if a post-national globalizing Europe might escape the harsh constraints of assimilative absorption. What has transpired instead is an intensive struggle over the mode of incorporation. The possibility of opening up Europe's core groups to non-Western Muslim outsiders 
has triggered a backlash movement among both elites and masses. This is certainly a social and political fight, but at its foundation are matters of, of culture, structures of feeling that for many make it seem inconceivable that non-white, non-Western, non-Christian Islamic people with their distinctive physical appearances, religious practices, political beliefs, and gender commitments possess the virtues required for participating civilly in democratic societies. Yet tens of millions of these stigmatized persons are in Europe to stay, and demographic and economic realities mean their percentage of the population will increase. As these persons have tried to move from the economic into the civil sphere, the empirical instabilities of assimilative incorporation have been vividly displayed. Allowing persons, but not their qualities, to be incorporated reinforces the foundational prejudices of core groups. It is the, the pollution of these qualities that must be challenged and changed. The culture structures of real civil societies needs broadening so that outsiders can become more familiar than strange. Only by making itself multicultural can Europe preserve its democratic values in the globalizing world it confronts today. Thank you. I'm going to answer any questions or respond to comments. Please feel free. We have a f 10 minutes. Could you stand up and speak louder? Thank you for the great speech about multiculturalism. I just have a few points because we're talking about the European civil sphere, and I'm just questioning if that even exists. For instance, the European Court of Human Rights often referred all the cases of traditions and customs to the national governments or uh, courts because they, they couldn't answer it, basically. And I also work at Parliament and I could see, for instance, that Polish migrants in, in the UK are not accepted very well because they stay in the short term and go back. So even before we talk about non-Western immigrants and their, the racism against them, I would, I would suggest that we have a problem of multiculturalism in, even within Europe. My second point is, how would you consider the liberal parts of minority cultures in our societies and are not civil rights very Western, in my opinion? I don't want to sound like a far right nationalist. <laughs> what, yes. uh, could you repeat that last question? And the last question is, how do you, would you build a community without some common grounds or some common values and what kind of alternative would you propose? Because, is more, I don't know, is, would multiculturalism not lead to some kind of communities living or side by side and then fostering more racism rather than finding some kind of integration? Well, there's a lot of questions there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what you've got to do with, I mean, my feeling about immigration is. Um, that reactions are strident and societies need to uh, trust themselves more in, than, they, than many groups inside the societies do. Um, there's a, a very powerful socializing force that goes on over one, two, and three generations. And uh, Western societies have a powerful uh, absorptive capacity. So assimilation and multiculturalism can go and do go hand in hand. At the same time, most of what the backlash focuses on have nothing to do with whether people actually can participate in civil society. So people say these immigrant groups are, are living apart. Well, why are they living apart? I mean, th this is something sociologists have studied for generations. They live apart because they're at a social disadvantage. There's discrimination. It gives them economic advantages to be together. And gradually, that dissipates over time. But if you look at the things that people say critically against these groups, it has to do with what kind of god they pray to. 
how they dress. It doesn't have to do with, do they have the rational capacity to evaluate their own situation? Do they have autonomy? Are they in jail? Are they criminals? No, I mean, so the discourse about multiculturalism against it and against new immigrants, it has really nothing intrinsically to do with their actual ability to participate in society. So I, 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 your last question reproduces the anti-multiculturalism discourse, really. I don't think there's a danger of, nobody wants to you know, set up their own society, but they have to protect themselves. Same way Jews, you know, it used to be argued, why are Jews living apart? Why? Why do, they, why, why do Jews stick together? Hundreds and hundreds of years. Because there wasn't a place for them in the society, obviously. It was very beneficial for them to live with people who treated them in a normal way. Um, your first question, I have more sympathy with definitely the idea that, I mean, look at the backlash against Romanians in England, the idea that the special status about Bulgarian and Romanians cannot come here to the UK is about to, I think in 2014, it's going to be lifted, or 2015, and people are hysterical because everybody knows that they're just awful people and they'll destroy the whole society. I mean, there's a moral panic going on in the media about what's going to happen. So, I mean, it's, it's very revealing, and I'm sure that, I mean, you're right, in a way, the whole effort to incorporate Eastern Europe post-89 post is a very interesting thing, but I do feel that that, that aspect of multiculturalism is going a lot better. And I think one could say that it's, it has a lot to do with shared Europeanness, um, shared Christianity, and the problems become um, exacerbated when Eastern European groups don't practice some of the same religion, for example, as, as other Europeans. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they definitely can demand uh, the protection of civil rights as they're defined in, in, in the common law here or in the Constitution. In other words, people cannot be enslaved, they can't be held against their will, uh, they can't be forced to do things from power. But the, the issue of gender has been, in my opinion, perverted by, by prejudice. So if you look at the, and it's most tellingly in France, which I've studied quite extensively, I mean, uh, the claim in France has been for the last 20 years that uh, women are forced through patriarchal power to do this, to, to wear the clothing, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's just not true. Study after study has shown that is not the case. That it's different to say people wear this from a culture of uh, difference about men and women, or that they do it out of a sense of piety and what women are supposed to do. I mean, I find Western societies very hypocritical, frankly, that it's as if we weren't civil societies before feminism. I mean, I support the rights of women. But I also know that Western societies were very proud of themselves when they were completely patriarchal and women couldn't vote. 
So I don't understand the grounds for now saying you can't be a citizen unless you support how we've just become 20 years ago. Of course, women's rights have to be protected fully according to the law. And if there is coercion within any community, that has, that's illegal, that's, that's immoral. But no, I find that the discourse of gender is understandable sociologically, and it should be struggled about. There should be open struggle to change the, the manners and mores and the beliefs about gender in some communities, but I find it um, exaggerated and, and actually part of the stigmatizing process. That's my own feeling. I wonder how much multicult multiculturalism and the sort of racism and Islamophobia in some ways altogether are kind of a, not a smokescreen, but they <coughs> debates about that clothe and confuse what might be the more fundamental issues perhaps of structural inequalities and it's a way it's easy to talk about this discrimination, for example, than it is about class inequality or global inequalities, and whether it's become a useful tool for both the left, um, who tend to cleave more towards multiculturalism, and the right, who might talk more about Islam, you know, be more Islamophobic. We can have those kind of discussions without having to talk about class inequality and the massive material changes that globalisation has brought since the 1970s and whether actually we're kind of missing one of the main points and one of the things which actually materially causes the problems within societies that most people face around housing, um, you know, ina inadequate services that are often articulated in terms of the immigration debate, but actually could also be positioned as a class debate and technology. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a very, that's a significant intervention and it's a, you know, a very reasonable point of view. I have disagree strongly with it. I mean, um, I'm not saying this is not important. But no, I understand, but the, the thing is yeah. that I think that the, I mean, in political philosophy, there's this uh, conflict between uh, distribution and recognition theories, um, and. My sense is that from starting in the, that there was this period from the mid 19th until the mid 20th century, if you want to be very global, where the main issues were class. After the war, there began to be somewhat successful but very incomplete welfare states built up. And the working class, per se, was incorporated in a remarkable manner, still very incomplete. And then in the 60s, new struggles emerged. And the major social movements of the last half century have been um, about race, gender, sexuality, and migration. And I don't think that that's a cover for anything. That is a fundamental social development. One of the unfortunate side effects of that has indeed been that class hasn't received the attention that it should, and people consciousness are all about culture and gender, et cetera, and class shouldn't be ignored. It's, and I think, I think class is gradually coming back on the screen in terms of, the con I think, with the Occupy movement and um, a lot of different things are bringing it back. But I don't think it's, it's like more foundational, a deeper thing, and that this takes people's ideas away. I feel that stigma of this kind cannot be alleviated by equality, just to take a contrary. Stigma, prejudice, is relatively independent of economic position. That you can have a large middle class black community in the United States, a large upper class, a large professional class, you'll still have racism. So that's, that's my own opinion, but it's uh, arguable. Um, my favourite ever saying on this kind of topic is from Italy, and it's that an Italian coffee is a coffee, um, but an African coffee is an African. Um, and so I wonder, 
with that in mind, how the anti-civil behaviours of core populations fit into your your model. I don't I don't understand your I don't mean your like favourite saying. <laughs> I may be culturally too far when, away. When people culturally look at a crime committed by a core population, so an Italian in Italy, they see a criminal. Oh, when see. they see a crime committed yeah. by someone of a different race, they see a race rather than a criminal. Mm -hmm. And so how do the anti-civil behaviours of, say, mm -hmm. British people in Britain fit into the, the model and the backlash against multiculturalism? Well, I mean, that's, you've just... I mean, that's what I, I thought I gave the talk to, to explain why that happens. I mean, if you say something's a crime as com compared to saying it's a you know, black and white crime, when you say it's a black crime, you're primordializing it. You're, not, you're identifying it with the particular identity in terms of race, ethnicity, religion. And uh, you create a, a distortion of, of, of social understanding. So that's what the social science studies I referred to earlier point out. As a matter of fact, the incorporation in many terms, of, in terms of education, in terms of economic mobility, in terms of language ability, is proceeding pretty remarkably in many ways of these new immigrants. Yet it's the... Uh, hatred and fear has increased. Um, I just, I, you know, so I, I think that's what I was, I was trying to get across. Um, I just wanted to explore the fact that if we are becoming more individual as a society, how would multiculturalism fit in? Because we seem to kind of think of any foreigner that brings in their own family, their own community, as a group of people. But if we are becoming in the West a little bit more individual, how is that going? It's like accepting something that doesn't, we don't want it to exist anymore. So mm. how does the two really interlink? Well, I'd have two responses to that. One is that we're not as individualistic as we think we are. We just don't see our own groupness. We are also members of ethnic, religious, regional, and other kinds of groups that are very visible to those who are outside. So the idea that modernity is makes people autonomous and um, individualistic is something of, I think, a delusion. Um, the other thing is that um, these immigrant groups are here in tens of millions. That means that we need to accept different ways of life. That's what multiculturalism is. So you say, oh, you want to wear a scarf. You want to cover your face. That's interesting. Uh, now, can you do this job? Can you vote? Okay, fine. That's, we, if, yes, many of these immigrants are more group than, than individual, for now, so what? Who cares? Well, could they be members of the society? Maybe they will vote liberally. Maybe they'll be this. Maybe they'll be that. It doesn't matter, you see, intrinsically. Why should the society only be filled with people who are like us? That's boring. That's what I'm saying in the beginning. That multiculturalism is the first, is radically new in nation states. Multiculturalism says we could be civil and still different, and we, should em we could embrace a set of differences as interesting, as compelling, et cetera, et cetera. And there are aspects of that, for example, I think, with homosexuality. It's fascinating. There's been a revolution, but also with gender. The idea once was, well, if you have feminism, women will have to be like men. 
Oh, no, it turns out not to be true. There's multiculturalism about gender today, which is that there are many different ways of being a successful and equal person in terms of gender. It used to be thought that if you were a woman and you acted like a woman, you could not be part of the core group. Homosexuality, too. And in regard to Jews, I think there's been a lot of opening up towards a multicultural appreciation of Jewishness, especially maybe in the United States and Canada, but I think everywhere else, too. So Jews go around, they demand kosher food. You know, hey, I get my kosher food. I can wear my kippah if I want to. I, want, I don't want to have to go to school on the high holidays, etc. People say, okay, yeah. There's almost a, you know, Woody Allen is a very popular person, etc. Why can't that happen with these other qualities? That's what, I mean, that's what multiculturalism opens up the possibility for, but there's, my argument here is that for certain groups, mostly Islamic groups, where um, there hasn't been a Holocaust, and there won't be, but the Holocaust was a contingent, unexpected event in a, in a deeply anti-Semitic civilization, which transformed, for unexpected reasons, the status of Jews. And that's probably one of the most important things that's happened in the 20th century, which is a, a group that was despised and persecuted inside the West and that was mass murdered, survived and helped that experience the way it was reworked. It was a critical learning experience for about, about prejudice, really. Yet that hasn't been extended to Islamic immigrants. Um, and I think that's the problem. Well, I'm really glad that you gave this example of the, about uh, feminism and uh, religion because it started to sound almost like a collusion with the racist and uh, the Nazis they by associating multiculturalism or the problems with multiculturalism with immigrants. So that was coming across as multiculturalism to do with immigrants coming and doing this and doing that. Mm -hmm. Almost like the fact that there are European Muslims, there are European Jews, there are European. They are not foreigners or immigrants. They are within, not they're here to stay because they've just come and maybe we can't shift them uh, by force or uh, extermination camps or whatever else. <laughs> they are, they're home, they're here. But uh, even in my talking, I say they, it's almost like we can't step out of the differentiation. Them. Yeah. failing or not failing becomes a mask for carrying on. I mean, what I wanted to say, yes, was that I think until the 1960s, throughout the whole history of modernity, the idea of a good society, of a national, a, na a national good society, was to become a homogeneous people. So people wanted to leave difference and enter into sameness. That was considered the key to being a powerful nation. In the United States, it was just, that was the mantra, you know, how can we become American as fast as possible? And there was a deep shame and stigma about, about difference, unless you were from England, of course, and it was good. Uh, <laughs> but um, then, I think there's been a really, really dramatic change in what I call the mode of incorporation, and that's why uh, race, um, sexuality, gender are all in very important examples. I think today diversity is considered good and not homogeneity in many aspects of our societies in the West. So that this is a very promising I think, development that has many different causes. But in regard to Islamic immigration, um, 
it's not working in, in the way that it should, which has to do with the whole crisis of globalization. I mean, all the problems of, and this is just the beginning, because as there's more and more globalization, there's going to be more and more immigration. And the old structure of the nation state as a homogeneous core group of primordial qualities, I mean, if, 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 if people insist on maintaining that, is there's going to be just tons and tons of, of problems. Tons of problems. And I'm not just talking about the West. Look at Japan with an incredibly shrinking uh, population and an incredible insistence on homogeneity. I mean, they're, they're going to have... They, they can't incorporate immigrants uh, in Japan. Even Japanese who leave for five years and come back are never accepted the rest of their lives as being really Japanese. So there's serious problems all over. It's not just us. It's, it's, and it's something that is a giant challenge, I think, for the future. And probably we should end now. Thanks. Thank